Once you understand that, you begin to comprehend John Akers's big bet on a loosely knit confederation of baby blues. He recognized that the vertically integrated industry was ending, and he believed this shift would ultimately take down his vertically integrated company. He was disaggregating IBM in order to embrace what he thought the new industry model was going to be. As I described earlier, I didn't agree with that path and reversed that direction, but I can understand the thinking behind it. After Unix cracked the foundation, the PC makers came along, swinging wrecking balls. While it's a gross oversimplification to say that IBM's biggest problem stemmed from the failure to lead in PCs, it's clear that the company failed to understand fully two things about personal computing. PCs would eventually be used by businesses and enterprises, not just by hobbyists and students. Because of that, we failed to size up the market properly and did not make it a high corporate priority. Because we did not think PCs would ever challenge IBM's core enterprise computing franchise, we surrendered control of the PCs. Highest value components, the operating system to Microsoft, and the microprocessor to Intel. By the time I arrived at IBM, those two companies had ridden this gift from IBM right to the top of the industry. 13. Making the big bets. If one were to reduce the story of the past decade to the bare essentials, the saga would pivot IBM's transformation over. On two big bets, one on the industry's direction, and one on IBM's own strategy. To understand what we did and why we did it, it's helpful to dial back in time and rejoin the discussion of IBM history, where it left off in the previous chapter. Remember that the 1994 timeframe I'm describing falls just prior to the internet revolution. There was a growing confidence inside IBM that the industry was on the cusp of a fundamental shift, the kind of change to the underlying model of computing that comes along about every 10 or 15 years. When that kind of a shift occurs, the companies that seize the moment and lead the movement do exceptionally well and everyone else dances to their tune. In the early 1990s the fortunes of the lead horses, in one way or another, were all related to the PC. Of course, that included the PC. Makers like Dell and Compaq. But without question the dominant. Leaders were Microsoft, which controlled the desktop operating. System, Windows, and Intel, which made the microprocessors. To illustrate the influence these companies wielded, the tandem of Microsoft's Windows and Intel's chips became known as the Wintel. Duopoly. So there was IBM, the company that had led the prior phase of computing and had invented many of the industry's most important technologies, crawling out of bed every morning to find its relevance, marginalized by the darlings of desktop computing, the people who had built the systems used by multinational corporations, universities, and world governments were now following the lead of purveyors of word processors and computer games. The situation was embarrassing and frustrating. However, no matter how miserable the present seemed, the future looked even worse. Their real motive, no one believed the PC companies would be content to be kingpins of the desktop. Their aspirations reached right to the heart of IBM's franchise, the large servers, enterprise software, and storage systems that anchored the business computing infrastructure. The very name of the new computing model they envisioned, client-server computing, revealed their worldview and bias. The client referred not to a person, but to the PC. The server described mainframes and other business systems that would be in service of the client providing applications, processing, and storage support. For hundreds of millions of PCs each day, the PC leader's pitch to business customers was simple and compelling, you want your employees to make productive use of your business data, applications, and knowledge, which are tied up on old back office systems. Right now those systems and your PCs don't work together. Since all of your PCs are already Microsoft and Intel machines, you should put in back-office systems that use the same technology. It was easy to play out the scenario. The PC leaders would march relentlessly up from the PC into business computing and displace IBM products, along with those of vendors like Sun, HP, Digital Equipment, and Oracle. Many of IBM's traditional competitors threw in the towel and joined the duopoly team. It would have been easy to follow HP and Unisys and all the rest down this path. All of the pundits who followed the industry saw the dominance of this model as inevitable. It would also have been easy simply to be stubborn and say that the changeover wasn't going to happen, then fight a rearguard action based on our historical view of a centralized computing model. 
What happened, however, is that we did neither. We saw two forces emerging in the industry that allowed us to chart a very different course. At the time, it was fraught with risk. But perhaps because the other alternatives were so unpalatable, we decided to stake the company's future on a totally different view of the industry. The first force emanated from the customers. I believed very strongly that customers would grow increasingly impatient with an industry structure that required them to integrate piece parts from many different suppliers. This was an integral part of the client-server model as it emerged in the 1980s. So we made a bet, one that, had we articulated it loudly at the time, would have left our colleagues in the industry rolling in the aisles. Our bet was this, over the next decade, customers would increasingly value companies that could provide solutions, solutions that integrated technology from various suppliers and, more important, integrated technology into the processes of an enterprise. We bet that the historical preoccupations with chip speeds, software versions, proprietary systems, and the like would wane, and that over time the information technology industry would be services-led, not technology-led. The second force we bet on was the emergence of a networked model of computing that would replace the PC-dominated world of 1994. Let me briefly describe our thinking at the time. A services-led model. As I stated earlier, I believed that the industry's disaggregation into thousands of niche players would make IT services a huge growth segment of the industry overall. All of the industry growth. Analyses and projections, from our own staffs and from third-party firms, supported this. For IBM, this clearly suggested that we should grow our services business, which was a promising part of our portfolio, but which was still seen as a second-class citizen next to IBM's hardware business. Services, it was pretty clear, could be a huge revenue growth engine for IBM. However, the more we thought about the long-term implications of this trend, an even more compelling motivation came into view. If customers were going to look to an integrator to help them envision, design, and build end-to-end -end solutions, then the companies playing that role would exert tremendous influence over the full range of technology decisions from architecture and applications to hardware and software choices. This would be a historic shift in customer buying behavior. For the first time, services companies, not technology firms, would be the tail wagging the dog. Suddenly, a decision that seemed rational and straightforward pursue a growth opportunity became a strategic imperative for the entire company. That was our first big bet to build not just the largest but the most influential services business in the industry. A networked model. The second big bet we placed was that standalone computing would give way to networks. That may not sound like a very big or risky bet today. But, again, this was in the context of the 1994 time frame, well before the internet became mainstream. The first rumblings of change were there. You could find certain industries, particularly telecommunications, that were buzzing about the information superhighway, a dazzling future of high-speed broadband connections to the workplace, home, and school. If this kind of wired world came about, it would change the way business and society functioned. It would also change the course of computing in profound ways. For one thing, it was virtually certain that world would be built on open industry standards. There would be no other way to fulfill the promise of ubiquitous connections among all the businesses, users, devices, and systems that would participate in a truly networked world. If that standards-based world came to pass, it would represent a major shift in the prevailing competitive landscape. In any other industry, we assume the existence of common standards. We take it for granted that unleaded gas will work in all gasoline-powered cars. We don't think about plugging in appliances or screwing in light bulbs or turning on faucets. Everything of this nature works because the various manufacturers and service providers in those industries agreed to common standards long ago. Believe it or not, that's not how things have worked in the IT industry. Based on my experience, it was the only industry on earth where suppliers built products to be compatible with their own gear but not with anyone else's. Once you bought one part of a manufacturer's product line, you were locked into everything else they made. Imagine, for example, buying a car and discovering you could purchase new tires, spark plugs, filters, accessories, and even the gasoline only from that car's manufacturer. Of course, I learned that this proprietary model was rooted in IBM's runaway success of the 1960s and 1970s. 
Other companies, most notably Microsoft, later emulated and perfected this approach and then doggedly refused to abandon it, for precisely the same reason that IBM initially resisted the tug of the Unix marketplace. Open computing represented a gigantic competitive threat to any company whose business model depended on its ability to control customers based on choke points in the architecture. Fortunately, by the 1980s there were pockets of radical thought inside IBM that were already agitating for the company to join the open movement. And by the mid-1990s, we'd mounted the massive technical and cultural effort required to repudiate closed computing at IBM and open up our products to interoperate with other industry-leading platforms.